workshop. My name is Dan. Um, yeah, so again, a little bit about myself. This, um, I'm a software engineer and visual artist. I am from Montana in the United States. And I moved to, oh, thank you. Is there another Montana here? Wow. <laughs> Missoula. Oh, cool. Nice. Uh, I live in Tokyo now, and I'm um, lead software engineer at Kerfgrid. And this is a picture of me with a real yak. But, so, and yeah, Kerfgrid, we're a small startup in Tokyo. We're 10 engineers now and a couple part time staff. And we're building a middle of where layer for Ethereum. We're trying to make blockchain easier to use. So this is a workshop. It's going to be about 90 minutes. There's going to be a lot of different components to this workshop. So I want to set some expectations, first of all. So I pitched this talk as beginner friendly, and it's a mixed level audience. It's DevCon. So I'm sure there's people in the audience that could probably code circles around me. It's Libity. There might be people that are writing their first smart contract. So if you're in the former category, maybe you can help your neighbor out and help them learn something. Or maybe you see a way of writing Solidity that's different or, or unique, and you can make a pull request against my open source code, fork the repo, you know, get creative with it. If I mention um, something that you worked on or a project that you really like, feel free to give some small golf clubs. Um, I'm going to cover a lot of different creative projects in um, the crypto space, and you know, hopefully. I think there's just a lot of really exciting stuff out there, so let's get into it. Next, I want to talk about what I mean by creative constraints. I think there's a couple more seats at the front, so feel welcome. <laughs> so in university, I studied fine art, and I also studied computer science and math, and my dirty secret is my art classes were harder. Um, but I continue to study printmaking and painting in Japan, and this is a woodblock that I'm working on. And so in printmaking, you might think about, OK, I want an image here of this train and cherry blossoms. And I have to think about the technical parts of separating it into different blocks and getting colored layers. So I was thinking a lot about the connection between art and science and how technical things can be very creative. Um, I think art has a lot of process, and coding has a lot of creativity. So that's one thing that I think about. The other thing is that sometimes in art, in technology, we encounter a roadblock. So here this man is running into the door, he can't unlock the door. And sometimes if we take a step back, we can see a new way forward. I find solidity uh, challenging, uh, but I also find it exciting and interesting. And there's you know, new ways of thinking that can be brought about when you encounter a challenge and have to be creative to get around it. So in the second part of the talk, I want to do a survey of games and creative projects in Ethereum. So first of all is ERC-20 tokens. So um, this is probably one of the most common terms that we talk about. It's a fungible token. Can anyone in 10 words or fewer give me a definition of fungible? Yeah? They're all the same. All the same. Sounds pretty good. Any other definitions? Visible part of that? Divisible, um, I think that's a separate, a separate one. But basically, one unit is exchangeable for another unit of the same thing. They, they can be interchangeable. So in currency, we can swap one for the other. And traditionally in video games, there's often in game currencies, but they're hosted on a particular server. So in Second Life, you have Linden dollars, but that's all centralized in Second Life's databases. Now, currencies uh, in games can actually live in their own world and you know, be traded in the open market. So a couple examples would be Decentraland's Mana and the Loom token. In contrast, we also have ERC721 tokens, which are non-fungible and great for collectibles. So the illustration for this picture I took is from a shop in Shibuya, Tokyo called Mandarake. There's also a store in Osaka, and it's these um, you know, vinyl collectible figurines that are very popular in Japan and around the world, and they're actually quite expensive, maybe tens of thousands of yen per each or a couple hundred US dollars. 
Uh, and they're all one of a kind. And so we're seeing some of that in blockchain. It's like, let's make some one of a kind goods. So I have a lot of examples to share. Uh, this one is super cute. I love these little round guys there. Um, Axie Infinity, these are based off of axolotls. The Japanese word for these is upo rupa, but um, that's an aside. But basically, they're generated via you know, code, and they have different features. This one's throwing a turnip and a carrot. Another one here has a watermelon on its head. And what they're useful for is assembling in small uh, squadrons and fighting in battle. So you basically collect these things, and then the game is making them fight. It's really adorable. You can also um, breed them. And so that would combine some of the code and mix them together. So here I have clover and baby, and sort of this stage of it growing up into a weird little bird. Um, yeah. Another example of ERC721 is more just of a collectible, but there's this kind of fun experience when you get to create a new building. So you pay some ETH to the smart contract, and it generates a one-of-a-kind building. <coughs> You know, it has different features like a different background, um, the era class, there are different heights. Some of them have rooftop pools. I wasn't lucky enough, but those are really neat. CryptoKitties is probably the most famous ERC721. And this is, let's see. I mean, there's a lot of delight in just what you might find. So there's all these features of cats and as you know, new cats are bred and um, generated, you, know, you can discover interesting mutations that adds a lot of whimsy and delight to these contracts. So you know, it's kind of fun to see this cat with the jungle background and demon horns and flame fur and this other orange one that kind of looks like a, a seal. Uh, so this game, you know, there's a, a ton of popularity and um, it's pretty fun. Crypto Kaiju combines these real world vinyl figurines using NFC to blockchain. So there's some neat mashups of the physical world and um, the digital world. And another example, not a game, but still really cool, the Austrian Postal Service issued um, this crypto stamp that's both a collectible and I guess you could mail someone you cared about a really cool letter. The other nice thing about ERC721 is they can be swapped and traded in different marketplaces. There's a couple more seats at the front, so feel free to step inside. Um, so OpenSea is a very popular marketplace that has a lot of crypto collectibles. BoxSwap allows trading of item to item. Codex is interesting that they're actually taking things that are not on the blockchain, like real world art and assets, and trying to connect it to ERC721. And there's plenty more that I'm not mentioning, but what's neat is it's not locked into any particular marketplace. Okay, I'm gonna step back into features of solidity that we might see in games. So payable functions, this is really integral. How do you buy your crypto kit? You send money, you send your ETH to a smart contract. Maybe you're playing a betting game. You send you know, ETH to some betting pool. Timestamps are pretty interesting too. FOMO 3D is just fascinating because it's um, based on the concept of fear of missing out. So the basic rules are when the timer ends, the last player to enter the game wins the pot, the pool. And anyone could pay to join the pool and extend the game by two minutes. The creators described it as a psychological social experiment in green. <laughs> I did a fun project with timestamps when I was doing my consensus project. So my coworkers created, as one of our first demos, um, a diamond-backed cryptocurrency. And there's a lot of projects that are putting assets in um, you know, backing things. And I thought, well, what's valuable in Japan? And the thing that's valuable in Japan is free. If you go to any department store, you might find a fancy musk melon that's worth maybe $100. This is pretty normal in Japan. They're used as gifts. You could even decide, I think the most expensive ones went for 27,000 US dollars for just a pair. And they have nice stems and they have a little bow on it. So I thought, this would be really fun to make a cryptocurrency. But the thing is, fruit goes bad. So what do you do then? You use the timestamp. And when the fruit rots, we can't trade it anymore. So we use the now keyword in Solidity. And you have to be a little careful with now. 
know, I know Solidity uh, Consensus is giving a, a security best practices later uh, this week, and they also have a lot of this online, but keep in mind that with the now keyword, miners can sort of fudge it a little bit and not get caught, so just, it's better to use wider time spans when doing comparisons. It's an open source project, it's not a real ICO, it's a satire, uh, but I made the logo, it's like the Ethereum logo is split, it's just a one that's broken in half. <laughs> so here's a little bit of the code. In the transfer function here, we have this is expired helper function that basically compares the current time to now. Hash functions, um, we'll see hash functions in the workshop at the end, the game we're building, but just a reminder, hash functions, we take a string or a bit of memory and run it through a function like catch act, that's the famous one in Solidity, and we you know, get out some bytes. Summary transactions, it's not specific to Ethereum, but I think it's really interesting. And the Axie Infinity folks did a really cool job with this. So with Ethereum transactions, you're paying gas, and you're also paying in time. And in a game, you know, that delay, sometimes people get impatient and want, I, they don't want to wait 15 seconds for an action to happen. So Axie Infinity has a lot of gameplay, and that happens off-chain. And then it, you can summarize it by clicking the sync, sync pending experience, sign a transaction, and send it, and then, um, you know, then, you're incentivized to do this to level up your little critter. At certain levels, they can breed or you know grow, and um, so it, it's a nice balance of putting things on the blockchain, but not slowing down games play and keeping the incentives for people to keep playing the game. It's also possible to use summarization and side chains. So rather than just putting things on the server, you could put it on a separate blockchain. You could you know, choose a blockchain that's more optimized for speed, computation, or scalability. And I'm just going to name drop a couple, uh, a couple people, uh, groups of people that are working in this space. Loom especially is really in the gaming space, and they're all about sidechains. So they have a, like a developer SDK that helps set up sidechains. And I think actually Axie Infinity is working with Loom now. Omize Go was one of the first developers of the Plasma um, Ethereum sidechain. And then, you know, there's other companies doing more general sidechain things like uh, Offchain Labs is doing sort of a privacy-preserving sidechain called Arbitrum. So there's the concept of burning, which would be maybe sending a token to the zero address. And, you know, maybe you could use that in a game. Maybe you could say high stakes crypto kitty betting, and now we've locked up our kitties forever in, in 0x7. It's also possible to layer and mash up smart contracts. Because contracts are public, anyone can interact with them. And that's a, just a really fascinating thing with blockchain. So does anyone know who's maybe done the Crypto Zombies tutorial? Does anyone know what Crypto Zombies eat? Crypto Kitties. Yeah, they eat Crypto Kitties. <laughs> I found one here that's shaped like a pickle. Uh, <laughs> it's very funny. And it's fun because while it can't actually destroy the Crypto Kitty, it doesn't hurt it, it does take the information and use that in their game. And it's a fantastic tutorial. It taught me solidity, so I highly recommend it. Kitty Hacks is pretty fun. It's an ERC721 on another ERC721. It was a Google Chrome plugin, although I think it's not in the Chrome store anymore, unfortunately. But you could have taken your Crypto Kitty and given it you know, a very dapper hat and a mustache and other accessories. And then there's metaverses, which are just ecosystems that, you know, uh, combine different blockchain technologies. So just a central land is a big one where you get parcels of land and you can put some of your crypto collectibles in there and they're partnering with different companies, um, different startups. So they just had a really big game jam and this was one of the demos of, you know, some of the video assets and things, the shark rendering thing. You can get a little character. Uh, yeah, I definitely want to explore this one more. Okay, so the first part I talked a lot about things in Solidity, and the second part I'm going to um, move a little bit into talking about some of the challenges, but with the caveat that challenges often bring us new ways of thinking and I, you know, opportunities for creative problem solving. So one of the challenges is that there's a lot of different tokens out there. 
here's a couple that are just in the game space, just a, just a handful that you might have to use if you play some of these games. And it's not always easy to get those tokens. So I'll give you a case study from my personal life. I am a US citizen residing in Japan. And I wanted to get Mana tokens so I could play Decentraland. And I have to complete the Know Your Customer or KYC process. So I go to an exchange in Japan and I say, I'd love to sign up. It looks really cool. And they say, well, you're a US citizen. Maybe you should do it in the United States. So I email the US side and sign up through their website. And say, well, you don't have a US mailing address where you're getting your bills paid. And we can't really, we don't know who you are. Where are you? So, oh, no thanks. I go to another exchange and they said, it's very difficult for us to verify US citizens. And our government doesn't make it easy, so you know, no worries. But thankfully, Coinbase, you know, after a couple failures, Coinbase let me get some Ethereum. So great, I'm, I'm partially the way there. And then I turn my Ethereum into wrapped Ethereum, or WEF. Uh, this token makes Ethereum behave more like the ERC-20 spec. And so the next step is just get some mana. Okay, so I go to the relay order book, and I put in a buy order for 100 mana. And nobody's selling. <laughs> Maybe five days later, somebody sells me. And I go to Decentraland to claim my avatar name. And because of rounding error, I have 99.999 mana. That's not enough mana. OK. <laughs> Back to the order book. One mana, please, somebody. A couple days later, somebody gets it. I can register my name. So the story has a happy ending. But it's not the easiest onboarding process to a game. We have to wait like 10 days. Another challenge is setting price. And this is really personal to creators. There's always a balance between making a profit on something and then getting people to buy it and lowering barriers to entry. And that's you know a very personal thing, uh, but it's just you know there's a trade-off there. The price also changes day to day, so gas fluctuates. Here's an example from sorry this is kind of small, but it goes from June of this year to mid September. We can see at towards the end of September that gas prices are quite a bit higher. Meanwhile, the underlying currency is quite volatile as well. So it just changes day to day. And here's an, another example. When I went to generate my block city, this little building in Atlanta, notice I'm calling the same smart contract here, 024A, same smart contract, three days apart, same cost in Ethereum, but the underlying cost in US dollars is totally different. So on the first day, it's um, $8.97 for the price, and then the gas fee is $3.75. Three days later, the, the transaction fee is $11.10, and the gas fee is only $1.24. So the overall tr um, transaction or contract call is cheaper, but it's interesting how these variables move very independently. There's also been a shift in just how games are played in terms of how do we charge for games. When I was a girl, you know, you'd get your you'd get your box, your game, you'd get your four diskettes, your mom would install it all day, and then you'd play it over and over, you'd play it as much as you want. Now games are they often have microtransactions. It's no longer a, a it's no longer a flat cost. So a game like Cow Clicker, you know, you've got to keep clicking on that cow and maybe you you pay to to turn that cow into a beef later, uh, but it's no longer a flat price, and, and that, you know, some people like that in games, some people don't. It's, it's just a different practice. It can work well in cryptocurrency, though, because you can pay in small chunks over time, but people might, you know, run out of ability to pay. There's also a time delay. I talked about this a little bit when we were talking about summary transactions and how Axie Infinity solved it. So there's this you know, wait for waiting for transactions to be mined. And I think the CryptoKitties team did a nice job of having some cute animations and building suspense. You kind of have this ghost cat while you wait for your cat to load, and that can be a little exciting. Like, what am I gonna get? So it can it can be an opportunity. Blockchain also is very uh, at risk to security exploits. FOMO 3D, I mentioned before. Let's review the rules. So when the timer ends, the last player will win the pool, and anyone could pay to join the pool and extend the game by two minutes. However, um, this team at SecBit wrote this really awesome article I highly recommend 
and they figured out how to exploit the whole Ethereum network to win the game. They basically sent some very high cost transactions that used up all the gas and ultimately failed, uh, but they were able to prevent anyone else from calling that smart contract in the next few blocks. So read more of Sekhmet's article if you're interested. It's, it's very interesting. Another consideration is, you know, how decentralized are our games? Ethereum wasn't made to support high fidelity data like images or, you know, large objects. Um, that's not what its strength is. It's more about establishing trust and, you know, um, so some of these things, it's like, where do you put the artwork? Where do you put any cache data before you've loaded it onto the blockchain? Sometimes things go sour despite the best intentions. You know, if a development team falls apart or their servers go down, how easy, easy is it for another party to come and recreate the game? Um, one example, you know, I think the Kitty Hats project looked awesome, but it's no longer available in the Chrome Web Store, so it's very hard to play this game. Now that Google said, I'm not sure of the circumstances, but it's not really playable. So this is not a game, but this is an art project that I think does a really good job of putting a lot of the data on chain. It's autoglyphs by a group called Larva Labs. And these are ERC721 collectibles. And these patterns are generated through a smart contract. And it's you know, not too hard for someone to build the image. Clearly the image is not stored on the smart contract, but the data is you could add a couple text characters and just use some code that you'd run to regenerate the image if you need. Another consideration is that Ethereum is public. So who has played Dungeons and Dragons before? I love that game. Um, it's a lot of Dungeons and Dragons you want to think about information hiding. So we have this character here and he's got the Game Master screen. screen. And he's, you know, if you're a Game Master, you're often hiding information from people and slowly revealing it to build a story, to drive a narrative, uh, maybe create some dramatic tension. So you might want that in your game. You know, um, contract calls are public and people can read those. People can go and read events and see the data in there. Uh, even your ID is a pseudonym, it's not truly anonymous. So you just might consider that in, in the game design. Okay, this next part, we're going to do a little bit of a hands-on activity. And first I'm going to explain the rules. Um, so, yeah, we'll, move, we'll use some of the ideas that we thought about Solidity, and we're going to um, take those and make our own games. So, in, for our purposes, we're going to think about three characteristics of games. So, we already talked a lot about well, features of Solidity that might be incorporated in games. And I want to dive into the detail on what the other two card categories are. So this, it, we're going to do a little bit of a card game. It's going to be kind of like apples to apples or cards against humanity. Okay, so game categories. What type of game are we playing? I'm going to name a couple that might not be common knowledge, just in case you draw the card so you know what it is. So one category of game is called a god game. And this is not in any specific religious sense. This is more that you're an omnipresent entity that can control a world. So in SimCity, you have this sky view you know, of this world, and you can build things and you know, decide how your citizens work and, and create these things. Roller Coaster Tycoon, it's just focused on the theme park and building roller coasters. One of my favorite games, Sim Ant from 1991. Has anyone played it? It's so good. But you're basically an ant, or you manage an ant colony, and you can become any ant. You can become the queen, you can become a worker ant or a soldier, and you're fighting for control of the backyard against rival ants and humans and lawnmowers. Another category of game that you probably will see in Osaka is a gacha pond. And this is a capsule dispenser. It dispenses a toy. It has a little bit of randomness because there's usually six different types of toys. And there's even a Bitcoin one I saw. You can pay 300 yen to get a plastic Bitcoin. See if you can find it. This one has the uh, gagashi chainsaw and drill and then some, some like Kuniyoshi cats. He's a famous artist in Japan. They're really fun and interesting, but it's just a bit of Random, random toy dispenser. Okay, let's talk about theme or setting, this type of card. 
Theme setting is critical to a game, and a lot of storytelling can be told without even any human presence. So I think all my favorite games are from the early 90s. My other, this is probably my very favorite computer game, but it's Myst. Has anyone played Myst? Yeah, uh, there's level channel one. There's no people in it. It's just this abandoned place, and it's misty and kind of dark, and you can see that people may have lived up above and you're just curious about, how do I get in there? How do I get into that world? So theme and setting is very important. We can draw inspiration from the world around us. So you know, Osaka has lots of fun neon and giant giant puffer fish and things to see. There's the world of Japanese uh, mythology, you know, Kuniyoshi prints and boys fighting fish and samurai riding toads. It's pretty <laughs> surreal. Okay, so I'm going to go through a couple examples of how the game's played. So we're going to have different types of cards, and there's different colors, and there's symbols on them too, if the colors are hard to see. Um, the green stars are the game category, we're going to draw two of those and discard one. Blue cards have a moon on them, we're going to draw three and discard one, so you have two cards left. And solidity features are going to draw two and discard one. <coughs> And so maybe you get a, game, uh, a hand like this, and you decide to pick your favorite. Okay, I'm going to choose a racing game. The features, the theme is that it's post-apocalyptic and it's about ducks. And I'm using the burning function, so I'm sending things to the zero address. So maybe I make a game called Mad Quacks to the Pond Warrior, and you know it's some hostile world where ducks have to fight for survival or get sent to zero X. Another example here, let's take a role-playing game, and we pick trains and Japanese mascots, and we're using layering of smart contracts. So perhaps I decide to use BRC721 collectibles and layer them together to build a Japanese rail network featuring cute mascots and wonderful trains and try to entice people to come ride my railway. Okay, so now we're gonna play it. First, what we're going to do is break into groups of maybe four to five people. And you can move your chairs a little bit as long as we move the chairs back at the end of the workshop. And some of us will be around to hand out decks of cards. It seems like we've come up with some really awesome ideas, and there's actually another part of this talk that's a sort of solidity workshop. Uh, so I'm, this has been awesome, and thanks for making these great ideas. Some of the things I've heard were um, like a yak princess betting arena, and um, a capybara racing where the loser's character is burned. Um, so there's some really wonderful ideas, and you can feel free to take your cards or, or play more later um, if you'd like. And um, I'd like to move into, if it's okay with people, to move into the next part of the exercise where we'll build a game and solidity together. And maybe you could take some of those ideas. And yeah, well, this one is really cool. I mean, we've got some sort of fairy tale with cursed, cursed clothing objects and treather tons of. And it's. You, we want to play it. You knocked it out of the park here, guys. This is, this is like D&D level. So, yeah, we'll save this one because this game just needs to happen. So, if, if that's all right with you, let's uh, maybe pull out our laptops and um, move into the next part. All right, so there's a, uh, there's a bit of a wide leg here. You have, you know, a laptop, and you hopefully connect to the internet. You can follow along with the slides. Okay, great. Um, yeah, well, you know, we'll, we'll come around and try to help 
you, if you have a question, raise your hand, and we'll do our best to keep everyone together. Yeah. So first of all, I want to go into what Stamp Rally is and what we're building. So Stamp Rally is a game that's often held by train companies. And so this one is a game that I completed. You go around to every train station on the Yamanote set in Tokyo, and you get a stamp. And when you get all the stamps, in addition to the satisfaction of spending three hours of your life, doing a lot of this. Uh, you get you know, a commemorative folder that commemorates the new era of Japan and the railways. Uh, so it's kind of a fun game. It's a treasure hunt. You'll see them all over Japan, and they're often connected with the trains. And there's a historical tradition to this called Goshimacho. This is a thousand-year-old tradition. This is when you go to um, Shinto shrines and Buddhist temples, you can get these really beautiful stamps and calligraphy. It's about 300 yen per page to get this written. And well, this stamp is actually a holy object and something that should be sacred and not mixed with this type of stamp. This is thought to be one of the origins of this modern game. So because I wanted to make my coworkers laugh and do something fun, I thought it would be really fun to build a stamp rally on the blockchain, where instead of visiting a physical address, you would enter a passphrase. Or you know, you can, in a virtual world, you can enter some like geo coordinates. And you would use your Ethereum address as your player ID, and then you if you collect all stamps, you could win a prize. So here's a little bit of what the front end looks like. This is DevCon Stamp Rally. Uh, it's an open source project on GitHub, and um, yeah, you know, there's a button where you can click to collect the stamp, and if you enter the correct passphrase correctly, it will load the picture. So first, let's make sure that we all have some Ethereum. Um, so, does anyone not have testnet, Rinkeby testnet Ethereum? Or does anyone not know what that means, I guess? So, and that's okay because we can go through it together if anyone doesn't have, you'll need that a mask. Okay, so yeah, we'll go through this. And um, for those of you who have been doing this a long time, please uh, be patient or maybe you can help out your neighbor. Uh, but you'll want to go to metamask.io and download, um, let's see, download this tool. I'm on slide 81, by the way, if people, are people able to access the slides? Yes. yes. From the yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, you're welcome to keep holding it, Jeff. You look great, but you can also probably set it down. So thanks. Let's go. <laughs> thanks so much. <laughs> So, yeah, we want to install the MetaMask, um, MetaMask tool here. And so we'll follow along in the slides. So, again, who doesn't have MetaMask installed? People with laptops. Okay. So, yeah, do help me. Okay, so some people are. I'm going to move ahead and, um, but. If you could follow along on the slide, I'll tell you which slide I'm on, so hopefully people can catch up. Um, yeah, and make sure to use zeros, not the letter O, in the link so that you can get the slide deck. It should both be zeros. So I'm going to briefly go through MetaMask and how that's set up. So this basically is a tool that lets us interact with the Ethereum blockchain. So we'll want to install it. It's at metamask.io, and I'm on slide 81. So if you're new to MetaMask, you'll click, yes, let's get set up to create a wallet. If you already have a seed trace, then probably you've used it before. Uh, but it's easiest to just click, yes, let's get set up. And uh, there's a point to set a secret backup phrase. And this is a really important step, but for the, the purpose of getting through this workshop, we're going to return to this later, or you might use your account forever. So it's important. There's a link on this slide, slide 83. But it's really important to um, use your backup phrase because, you know, in a centralized ecosystem, you could call your bank, I forgot my password. That doesn't exist. I forgot my password. It doesn't exist here. Okay. And if you have a fresh account, it should look like this. Okay, so the next step would be to get some Rinkeby test network key. And can anyone tell me uh, what the difference between the test network and the mainnet is? 
there's so many things. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of things to say, but um, whether it's a different algorithm or things, but um, one of the purposes is, you know, it just gives us a way to try things out before making our game live. So that's like the really short version, but I'm sure there's a lot more depth there. And you can use a faucet if you have a Twitter or a Facebook account. If you don't have one of those, ask your neighbor to send you some. <coughs> We're going to go on the Rinkeby testnet. That's one of the testnets out there. And so this link here, faucet.rinkeby.io. Well, my slides are also, uh, they're public, and uh, the tutorial's on GitHub too, so um, sorry about the Wi-Fi, but it is possible to sort of follow along this material after. So I'm going to keep proceeding. You know, how you get Rink and test ether here is you click in Metapass on the little box and make sure you're on the Rink and network. You select that in the top and click on the account to um, copy the address. So slide 87 here shows how to copy that. And then you log into Twitter or Facebook and you would make a post with your address. And then you would click on the share button to share that. <coughs> copy the link to the tweet. I don't have Facebook, so I don't know how it works, uh, but I have Twitter. And then you paste it into that faucet. And you select give me ether and choose how much ether you want. And you know, in a little while, we'll get mined into the blockchain, and you'll see your ETH there. I think three is probably good. Okay, one one's sufficient. Don't need much, but yeah, if you already have some ring feed, you're good. So, any questions on this stuff so far? All right. Okay. Next, let's talk about remix. So Remix is an in-browser editor for Solidity. Who's used Remix before? Yeah, so most people. Great. It's changed a little bit in the last few months. There's a new UI, so I'm going to review things just in case you haven't seen the latest and greatest. Uh, but one of the main changes is it has these features called modules on the sidebar. So it's best when you get to the main page to click this environment button here and choose Solidity, and it will load the compiler and the deployment modules and the, the file editor, so you have all the all the tools you need. So if you go to the um, remix.ethereum.org, and I'm on slide 94 if you're following along with the deck. Okay, so Good job. To be next open, we're going to create a new file. We're going to call it stamprally.sol. And actually, in the file explorer, that's the icon all the way over um, on the top. And then you'll click the plus button to make a new file. And you can give it the name. SOL is for Solidity. And then let's get into the code. So there's a on slide 98, there's a link to a gist that has some of the code here. Let me just show you what that looks like. Um, here, and we'll go to. There are some bits of code that you can copy and paste into your uh, Solidity editor here. And let me make this a little bit bigger. Um, yeah. So I have that, and I've copied it into. And copied it into my Solidity editor. People with me are still fighting the internet. <laughs> so sorry, this might just be a, a demo and less interactive. Um, yeah. Yeah. You don't have a Twitter? Um, can you? I guess um, I just love Yeah, yeah. Ty here will send you some. Right, the, What's the address? I can get your address. Awesome. Thank you, Ty. Okay. Oh, I've got to type that. <laughs> 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 I know, I know. Yeah, oh, 
and I can verify. Uh, oh, I didn't give it any parameters, so yeah, let me give it. Hey, and um, I think I deleted the one that I just made. Oh, I have to click the button as well. Yeah. <laughs> People getting the constructor, constructor in there. Okay, so yeah. Any questions on that so far? Okay, I'm gonna move forward. And we're gonna talk about function modifiers. So here's an example of a function modifier. It's a pretty common one. And basically function modifiers are syntactic sugar that let us check some preconditions on a function or change the way the function behaves. So this one is called only owner. And it means that only the owner can call the smart contract, or that method. Basically here, they we're gonna have a require statement and look at message.sender. Message.sender is a special reserved word, or reserved sequence in Solidity that means this is the address that's calling the contract. And we can check it against the owner that we've registered in the constructor and make sure that, you know, who is changing the stamps? It should be only the game manager. We don't want outsiders messing with our game. And uh, then it's really important that modifiers have this underscore and a semicolon because that's that means the rest of the code in the function body will be run later. So it's actually equivalent. The only owner is equivalent to writing code where there's a require statement at the beginning. These are two ways of, I guess, yeah, two ways of doing the same thing. So it's your turn now. Uh, we want to write a modifier, and it's going to be called valid position. It's going to take a unit eight of underscore position, and we want to check that the position in the stamp is greater than or equal to zero, and less than the number of total stamps in the game. So you can uh, copy the template or just type it from the gist, from the function modifier part, you can copy this here, and I would recommend looking at only owner as a reference. So we'll paste that in under to do too. And you know, you might get a little red pop up that your uh, the compiler's angry, and I'll let you figure out how to make it happy again. So yeah, let's. I'll give you about five minutes to work on that. Feel free to work together if you're having trouble with your internet, and I'll come around. Cool. Uh, does anyone want to share their answer? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so the function body is just like require ground down validity expression uh, position greater than equal to zero and then uh, position less than. Yeah, great. Yeah, number of stamps. <coughs> so, yeah, I made mine a little simpler because it's an unsigned in, so it's totally fine compared to zero. It's also equivalent that unsigned ints cannot be negative, so it can be like this, but both are valid solutions. So feel free to copy this in, and then we've got this part running. Cool. Okay, next we're gonna talk a little bit about storage and memory. So in Solidity, you know, we've seen, just talked about unsigned ints, sort of simple types, but more complex types, such as strings or structs, need to be stored differently. And we need to tell the compiler a little guideline about how we store things. So storage and is a keyword that can be used for things that are persistent. And this is great, but it's more expensive to store on the blockchain because you're making this data be put into this permanent record and hosted on other people's computers. So very important for state variables, anything local to the contract state. Memory is for things that are not persistent, for just local computations or temporary variables if you're moving the data around. So here's an example where we are storing a stamp key and we can use the storage keyword, the permit variable, and assign that stamp key to a permanent variable on the blockchain. Versus in memory where we have a temporary variable and it's just that keyword is all that you need. 
So if we go to the code to store the player's cards on the blockchain, we'll copy some of this here from the gist. We've got the rally card, which is a struct with the number of stamps, then we're going to store all the cards in the game. Then we have something that links to a rally card, and this lookup table between the player. And, yeah, um, it might be easiest to uh, just kind of copy the code from the gist. We're going to have this function here that kind of dealt with some of the code on the other slide. And, uh, oh, actually, no, sorry. This is an example I wanted to show of with the user having a stamp. And because this is just a check of data that's already on the blockchain, when we retrieve the user card, we can use the memory keyword because we don't need to store it again. We're just looking it up and returning some of that data to the user. We're returning, um, yeah, the Boolean value of whether or not they have a stamp. And so uh, a memory example would be if the user has the stamp and we're trying to get the stamp image, if they have the stamp, then we're going to also, yeah, using, using memory here, returning a URL just making a temporary copy. In a center function, though, we'll need to persist things. So, yeah, let's see. This one will copy, and I'll let you fill in blank on this code. How do we assign the stamp key? In the question marks here, do we use storage or do we use memory? And so, yeah, your exercise will be right the center. So let me go to the gist here, and we'll copy this section three here, code to store players cards. It's a bit of code here, but we'll copy it into Remix. And you'll see the to do write B. And there's a hint that the first line will look of this form. So I'll give you a couple minutes to work on that. All right, does anyone have the answer? Or is close? Let's see, is it memory or storage? Storage. 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 Why? Wow. Right, because we want to persist that the user uh, is collecting the stamp. So we'll use storage, and then we do an assignment here where we assign the, the parameter variables to the local uh, storage object here. Okay, so the last, I think we have maybe 10 minutes left, and I want to make sure that we actually get to play the game at this time. So let me skip ahead a little bit. I'm going to just jump into, and yeah, if you like this or want to keep playing with it, it's on GitHub. You can make a pull request, you can follow along. Um, you know, it's a work in progress. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Web3. So, Web3.js is one of the libraries available for connecting, um, connecting to the Ethereum blockchain. So put some JavaScript and some fun pictures on the front of your smart contract. And so we'll be using MetaMask to sign transactions. So if you could go to and killzergithubio slash blockchain stamp rally, um, I'm on slide 125 and there's a link, then we can actually see it in action here. Here it is again. So people will load that up and have your MetaMask wallets ready. Look like this. So you might need to make sure that it's connected. And click on MetaMask and make sure that it might give a pop-up about connecting and please allow it. And then you, let me choose an address where I have it. And then for the collect the stamp, the password is octopus, all lowercase. And then you click submit. You should get a pop-up to sign the transaction. Click confirm. And yeah, make sure you're on repeat. <laughs> um, and you'll have to wait a moment and it should load the stamp. It takes a little while if you mind. People are interested in looking at the deployed contract. It's um, in the slides, actually, I think I linked to it on Etherscan if you want to.